excited to finally be able to get into this series. Pastor Josh has just brought it. Yes. So uh, this was uh, God moved on his heart to, to do this um, series. He is definitely better at eschatology than I am. I'm like, you know, I just know stay close to Jesus because that's the most important thing. <laughs> but but uh, this is this is so good because we have been going over really just like the first uh, uh, couple chapters in the book of Revelation when there are seven letters that are sent to seven actual churches. But the cool thing is even though those were real churches and real letters from God to those churches, those letters are in the word. So they still speak to us today. And there's things that we can get from those letters today. And I'm on the third church today called Pergamum. So Pergamum, that is a fun name. I practiced it for you guys because I love you so much. So, yes, we are on that third church. And this church, if I could sum it up in one word, it would be compromising. A compromising church. And that is not just my opinion. You can YouTube, and there's all kinds of smarter people than me that said that's what it is. It's a compromising church. And we're going to get into that. Um, but we're going to just go over a brief uh, overview of the other churches that we've already discussed. Uh, Pastor Josh talked about Ephesus, and they resisted false teaching. And then, but, but they also lost their first love and had to go back and do the things they did before. But then you had Smyrna, 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 Smurf Church. <laughs> I'm so glad he had that one, not me. But that was a good church. They really didn't even have a rebuke from the Lord. There's only two of the seven that really didn't get a correction there, and that was one of them. They really endured a lot of persecution. Well, Perg Pergama, well, they faced persecution as well, and they withstand persecution. But even though they stood up against persecution, it was those little foxes that came in, the little compromise that came in and really could have destroyed them if they didn't turn back to God. And this is the thing. Sometimes we have the strength to stand up against the big thing, and yet we don't see the little things in our life that are ruining our fruit, that are causing us to compromise. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, here real soon, but we're going to go right to the word, and we're going to read it. You ready? All right, we're going to Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 through 17. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, you can open it up, or you can look on the screen. And I think this is the ESV version, but that's typically what I use. But I might be wrong. It might be the NIV. I can't remember. It's one of the good ones there. So anyway, verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Right. The words of him who has the sharp two edged sword. Remember that. Highlight it if you, or star it if you have a pen, if you got your Bible. Two edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's th throne is. Have you ever felt like you lived in a community that Satan's throne is right there? I have. There's been, you guys know uh, we started an inner city ministry and there was a time. There was a time our block was so bad that literally had somebody murdered in front of our house. My husband was the first on the scene to someone who was stabbed in front of our house. And he broke up a game fight by blowing the shofar. Y'all don't even know about all that. I'm not even exaggerating. That truly happened in the, in the early 2000s. So I know all about feeling like I'm living where Satan's throne is. And this is what the scripture says. I know where you dwell. Where I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you, where, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Remember, I taught about Balaam when I taught uh, at Palm Sunday with the, two, the tale of the two donkeys here who taught Balak to put stumbling blocks before the sons of Israel so they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. We're going to get there. Verse 15 says, And you have some who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. Do what? Repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone with no one that no one knows except those who receive it. Amen, amen. The reading of the word is powerful. We're going to break down those verses um, and hear what God says to us about how to overcome compromise in our own life. But before we go there, I like to give a little bit of a background of the church because in hermeneutics, one of the best practices is, is, of course, to read the scripture in its context. And then another really good practice to have is to understand who the original audience was, what was their culture, what was their historic background, and what it was, what was the purpose of the author to the original audience, and then how to apply it. So a little bit about per Pergamum. I'm going to try not to go too nerdy on you. You guys know I like to get a little nerdy, though. Um, the, they had a, a cultural and religious diversity. I think America can relate to that. A lot of diversity. So not only do they have Christians that lived there, but they also... You know, they had people who worshipped Greek gods and goddesses. They had, they had actually what was known as uh, one of their sites that they were most famous for is they had a temple and a big, huge statue to Zeus, who was like the god of the gods of the Greek world, right? And so they had this big temple. Matter of fact, uh, eventually it was uh, uh, somewhat destroyed and then rebuilt and moved, and now they have that same temple in Berlin and, well, not the temple, but the statue in a museum, okay? So this was like a very, uh, it, was, it helped make their city famous, this temple and this statue to Zeus. But they, re they worshiped all kinds uh, of other Greek gods and goddesses as well and had temples and altars to these Greek gods. But also, uh, they, worshiped the, they, they worshiped the Caesars, the, the imp emperors of Rome. So they believed that whoever was in charge of Rome was a god himself, okay? So they, they worshiped demons, <laughs> and they worshiped man. And yet they had Christians there as well. So they had all that going on. Uh, they were, again, very famous for the great altar of Zeus. It was a very impressive structure. You can look it up um, even online. I meant to put a picture, but that didn't happen with this week. <laughs> um, they also had a huge educational system there. They had the second greatest library in the world. Some believed it was comparable to uh, the Library of Alexandria. I guess in history, eventually Mark Anthony gifted all these books that was in this library to Cleopatra. So it's pretty. it was a pretty famous library. So they were not only um, did they have diversity, but they were what I would say they were intellectuals. In that time, everybody, they didn't live in the information age. Everybody can be smart now. I'm substituting in schools and like, hold up, fact checking. All you got, bust out your phone. Everyone can know something now. But back then, you actually had to have books. And to be a part of a community that had that many books, they were very intellectual. They were very intellectual. Um, and they also had a great, uh, they were very forward thinking with medicine. They had great medical centers. So uh, they had advancements in that way. They were wealthy. The city is what, what would be considered Turkey today. It was, um, I think the, the modern day uh, city is called Bergenum, which is kind of similar to Pergamum, right? And they, they were, this city was on a hill, not too far from the sea, but on a hill. It was, lo it was a beautifully located, beautifully positioned. They were wise as far as book smarts goes. <laughs> and yet they, ha and they had a, a diverse culture they, they, they were politically significant because Pergamum was the capital of the Roman prov provenance of the Asia Minor. So uh, basically, they were like a very important city. Roman authority had a lot of sway in that city. Very important city. But with all these things that they had going for them, they had some things, especially with the Christian community going against them. We have to be careful, friends, because when we live in a rich culture, it's very easy for that culture to come into our faith and pollute our faith. And that's what happened to the church of Pergamum. They began to compromise. So they stood up against the big demons. They stood up against Zeus. They didn't worship Zeus. 
but they fell victim to false doctrine and false teaching, and they let little compromises come into their life. So we're going to learn today how to overcome compromise, lessons from the church of Pergamon. Amen? You ready? All right, we're going to get into this. Number one, champion complexity of character in the church. If you have that first line, that, that, that blank is complexity. So often we put Jesus in a box. We put God into a box. He can only be one thing. He can only be the, you know, we only see Jesus the way maybe we want to see him. And, and very, it's very easy to only see Jesus as a meek, suffering servant who went to the cross for our sins, died on the cross, and rose again. And he is. But he's also a warring God who is coming back for his church without spot and wrinkle. So that two-edged sword that, that says, that describes Jesus' character is coming, you know, elsewhere in scripture it says it's coming from his mouth. That two-edged sword, we need to realize that that represents judgment and that represents him being a, a picture of a warrior Jesus, not a picture of a gentle Jesus, but he's coming back this time as a warrior Jesus. And we have to understand, just like God is multifaceted, he created us in his image. We also have complexity. This is where people mess up. I was, I don't really have time to get on social now. I usually schedule my things, but I had a little break, and I needed a little brain break from all the things that's going on up here. <laughs> you don't want to see this. And so I made the mistake of getting on social media, and, and I was looking um, on this resource that has for pastors, and it was talking about burnout. And I looked at a comment that someone said, and they said, Pastors who burn out aren't really called to ministry because if you're a pastor and you ever face burnout, you must not be called. And I thought, I guarantee you this dude ain't never worked in ministry in a day in his life. <laughs> and, and, and the person who was running, you know, this, this thing was like, well, so it's either 70% of pastors were never called or your, your assumption is wrong. This is the thing. There's complexity. You could be called in ministry and be passionate for God and still suffer from burnout. There's complexity. Jesus is humble and meek and gentle, but he's also a warring God coming back for a church without spot and wrinkle. Jesus is, he is humble and, and full of grace, but he's also full of, he's, he, he cares about justice and he cares about uh, righteousness and holiness. And friends, you too are created in his image and have complexity. And what happens is there's parts of us that we don't like, that we don't put out for the world to show. In psychology, they call it the shadow. It's a very interesting theory. But there, it's true in the fact that there's parts of us that most of us don't like, that we don't want to deal with. And what happens with a lot of Christian people is because we deny that part even existing that in moments of weakness, we fall into it. And why do we see these big pastors all of a sudden on the news because they had sexual affairs on their, their wives or their, or their husbands or whatever it is. There's ones who are, you know, stealing money from the church and all these things. And we think, how could that happen? Because if we do not acknowledge the sinful nature that's in all of us and, and realize it's but by the grace of God, that sinful nature can't take over. Okay. We all have it. And oftentimes it is almost the opposite. I'm a very joyful, outgoing person. I got that way eventually. I don't know if I was always like that as a kid. But I had people tell me all the time, oh, your mom and dad named you right. But there's another part of me that I have to fight with, with you know, depressing thoughts, <laughs> angry thoughts. Sometimes I want to slap somebody. <laughs> right? And... and I have to acknowledge that part so that I can crucify that part and submit that part to God and realize that sometimes my anger is not even sinful. Sometimes I'm justified in my anger. I just got to make sure I'm doing the right thing, like not slapping someone, but maybe <laughs> confronting somebody in love, right? And there's those complexities in every single one of us because you're created in God's nature. You can be both happy and hurting, humble, and ambitious, full of faith, and doubting at times. 
That was their fill in the blanks that you guys missed. <laughs> it, it's true. And we need to acknowledge those things because if not like Pergamum, it can come in like compromise. It can come in like compromise if we don't realize we are created in complex character and that God, too, is complex. Yes, he's gentle. Yes, he's humble. But that doesn't mean that we're to trample on his grace. He's still righteous. He's still the judge. He's still the ruler. And he's still a warrior. Amen? So we have to overcome by understanding and respecting complexity of character. Champion it. It's okay. It's okay to be complex. I used to like brag like, oh, I'm what you see is what you get. And then I got like 30 and then definitely after the 40s, I was like, ooh, I'm a lot more complex. Sorry, babe. Deceived you not by accident. I didn't even know there was this much to me, right? All of us. All of us get like that. There's more to you than meets the eye. There's more to Christ. That's why you can be serving the Lord for 50 years, read your Bible, and get a completely new revelation. Because there's more to him than what you know. Amen. Let's move on to the next one. We overcome compromise by celebrating our past victories. We have to celebrate our past victories to give us courage For the current battle. Come on, somebody. We celebrate our past victories to give us courage for the current battle. I love what Jesus did here in this letter. He says, before he brings a rebuke, you know what he does? He acknowledges that they withstood persecution. He acknowledges that they they were they did not bow down to Satan's throne. He compliments them, and he commends them for their effort. We have to celebrate our past victories so that we can have the courage for our current battles. And this is the thing. Please get this. If you don't get nothing else today, this needs to be bold, and I don't even know. Did I put it on here? I'm not sure. But I did. Connection before correction is so important to create actual change. So many people want to change themselves, but know that you can't even change yourself without a relationship and connection to Christ. You don't got the strength to do it by your own. And so many of us, as loving parents, loving neighbors, sisters, wives, husbands, (laughs) we sometimes see things in people close to us that we, we know needs to change. Maybe there's some compromise in their life. And we want to tell them about themselves. But if you do not have that connection, they are not going to receive it from you anyway. And sometimes they have to fall flat on their face to see, and that is hard. But when the prodigal son said, give me my money, give it to me now, I'm about to go out, the dad didn't talk him out of doing what he wanted to do. The dad knew that was, that is gonna, that's reckless, Right? And what did he do? He went and he had reckless living, but the dad gave it to him anyway because God gives us free choice. Otherwise, we would be robots. We would all be AI. They're going to take over eventually anyway, so we need to get it together. (laughs) Thank you. One nerd with me. Come on. Yes. Josh is like, AIs are demonic. I'm like, the one I use is saved and sanctified. (laughs) Oh, God is good. We have to have that connection, friends. We have to have connection <laughs> if we want to see change in ourselves and if we want to see change in other, other people. We have to have that connection. Amen. So Jesus set the example, and not just in this letter, but in every letter, he commends the church before he corrects the church. So often we live in a, in, a, in a generation, right, like the guy who was on Facebook, well, these pastors must not be called. Let's just talk about somebody. Let's just talk about everything that they do wrong and not see anything that they do right. That's going to build them up and make them feel like they are more than conquerors, <laughs> right? In psychology, they call, it, they call it unconditional positive regard. Like, I'm like, wow, how are they teaching people? There's a lot of Therapists out there that aren't Christians that are giving more unconditional positive regard than what the church does to its own members, we got to do better, guys. We got to do better. It's, co- it's, co- it's because they're complex. It's, I, I see people doing wrong. I'm like, that's not who they are. 
That's the sinful nature. That's, that's them giving into temptation, giving into de- uh, deception, but that's not who they are. And I'm not going to just focus on that part. There's times with connection that I have to bring a correction. But let me also focus on what they do right, and that is what Jesus did for us. Praise God. Amen. Amen. All right. It shows you that you can serve God even in a city that worships Satan and pagan gods. Because that's what this church did. They served God and did not bow down. They did not bow down. Friends, God is looking for people who will not bow down. Amen. Okay, so we overcome compromise also by And this is one of the biggest ones, and everybody's ready to get to this one. Usually people skip the first two things I talked about, and they get to confronting false doctrine. (laughs) Oh, man, this is like some people's favorite thing to do. And it is true. We do need to confront false doctrine because there's a lot of deception in the world. Pastor Josh preached a word a few months back on deception. I got to hear it twice here and at the South Little campus, and it was so good because deception will pull you in, and you will not even realize. The Bible says even the elect can be deceived, okay? So we do need to confront false doctrines, and there was two false doctrines that came into the church of Pergamum that they fell into, even though they resisted Satan's throne. They did not bow to Satan's throne, and yet they still gave into these two false doctrines. Well, what are these two false doctrines? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to talk about it. You ready? One, the influence of Balaam. Ooh, let's talk about Balaam. Now, you guys know this is actually one of my favorite Old Testament stories because it's so interesting. The dude was so complex himself. Balaam, the Bible actually says he was a prophet of God, and yet He was like also like an occult leader. It was very interesting. It's like he was a prophet of God. That's what it did not say anything to to elude otherwise. And yet he did he did evil. So so Balak in Numbers 22, go back, I'm gonna give you a quick review, go back and look at it. But Balak hired Balaam to curse God's people. And so he goes, first, well. Interesting enough, the craziest part about the story that all the kids in kids' church know is he was on his way to, you know, to curse God's people, and his donkey talked to him. (laughs) I say, God can use a donkey, he can use anybody, amen? His donkey literally turned to him and said, why are you beating me? There is an angel that's blocking the way. (laughs) And his donkey got his attention. God does all kinds of things to get our attention. Oh, man, sometimes we miss it, and then there's, like, something very obvious that happens that gets our attention. That's what happened to Balaam. And so um, several different times, uh, I believe at least three, he went to go curse God's people, and instead he blessed them because he said to Balak, I can only speak what God tells me to speak. And so he did. He spoke the word of God. It is in Scripture, and what he spoke actually has come to pass according to the Scriptures. We see that if you go back and read it. However, You know, the king was not happy because he paid this guy money to curse God's people. And so Balaam was so sneaky. He said, listen, I can't curse them by speaking something that God doesn't say, but I can teach you how to get them. And he, he, he basically tempted the men to, have, uh, to commit sexual immorality with, with women who did not serve Yahweh, who did not serve God. And he set up idols and sexual immorality. And I'm going to tell you, those are the two things that get so many people. Idols and sexual immorality. Because we don't acknowledge the complexity of our human nature. Because we don't don't get real with us. Most people have zero self-awareness. It's actually scary. (laughs) The Bible talks about, Jesus says, you judge somebody else for a speck in their eye. Meanwhile, you have a plank in your own eye. You know what? What you see in other people very often is mirroring something bigger in your own life. And so we have to take a look and have some self-awareness and say, oh, my goodness, what's going on? I'm going to tell you the two areas that the enemy tries to get us, and it's through deception. It's not, it's not that you're bowing down to Satan. It's that 
maybe you let in a little a little um, yeast with your manna. Maybe you let in, you know, something that you didn't realize. It was those little foxes that ruined the vine. You didn't realize that, you know what, this movie that you're watching has some sexual scenes that's causing you to go to certain sites on your phone that should be blocked that you don't even realize because you let in a little compromise. Maybe it's a little idol in your life that you say, you know what, <laughs> I use it for so many other things, but you've been on your phone all week and haven't been on your Bible app once. Lord, forgive me. Come on. Right? There's idols in our life that keep us from doing what God has called us to do. And we need to be aware of Balaam's idols and sexual immorality. The doctrine of Balaam is idolatry idolatry, and sexual immorality. The Dr. Mabam, go back again, read Numbers 22, read the whole story. But the Nicolaitans, there's less in the actual scriptures that tell us what the Nicolaitans, what they taught. It's more about church history. And there's two main theories about the Nicolaitans. I'm going to share both of them with you. I actually believe maybe both of them could, could be together, but I lean more towards the first theory. So the first theory of the doctrine or the teachings of the Nicolaitans and it, they believe it came from um, Nicholas, who was one of the seven deacons in, in Acts. Was that Acts chapter 7? Or no, one of the five deacons. No. Yeah, seven deacons in Acts chapter 5. Sorry, my dyslexia messes me up with numbers. So <laughs> that's what's going on there. So he's one of the original deacons, and church history teaches that he ended up teaching a false doctrine. They named it. Uh, the Nicolaitans, the teaching of the Nicolaitans, and that they that the main thing is, is that he per, that there was a perversion of grace. Go, you can sin and do everything you want to do, and it's going to be okay because Jesus will forgive you, gentle Jesus. Leonard Ravenhill says he calls it easy believism. Yep, that's what he calls it. It's, oh, I can get saved, and I can just go ahead and just do everything I want to do because God is going to forgive me anyway because praise the Lord for his blood. But the Bible says that you can trample on the blood of Jesus. It is better for you not to even been saved than to be saved and then trample on the blood of Jesus. And so, so many people, I see this in American church culture so much. They focus so much on grace that there's no process of sanctification. Sanctification is progressive. It is the process of going from being a sinner to a saint. It does not happen overnight. This is what messes people up because you are saved overnight. If you give your heart to Jesus, sinner, saved, like that. But there is a sanctification process that takes time. I'm still being sanctified. I've been serving Jesus since I was 19 years old, full wholeheartedly, whatever he says. And I'm still being sanctified. I still have to apologize. I still get it wrong. I still mess up. I still have to take a hard and deep look at myself. I still lose my temper, mostly once in a while with justice. (laughs) My sons of thunder, my last two kids. Woo, they have made me more holy. (laughs) And all of us, all of us are still being sanctified. And we have to know that I was saved, I am being saved, and I'm going to be saved. That's good doctrine, okay? I was saved the day I gave my heart to the Lord. I I am being saved right now because I'm being sanctified right now. And then those who endure to the end will be saved, friends. That is scripture. That is good doctrine. And we miss it. In uh, in one of my uh, counseling classes this week, and this is a Christian, you know, school that I'm in, they were saying what, what messes some Christians up is that there's not a good process of uh, of behavior or change in people and, and like the life model and how you grow. It, it, we don't really teach that much. And I'm sitting there listening. Yeah, we do. It's called sanctification. But then I realized the church really doesn't focus on sanctification because we focus on get saved and then we're going to entertain you. Come to church, but we're not going to disciple you. It's called discipleship, friends.
friends. And guess who's responsible for their own discipleship? The pastor, the leader, the kids' church pastor. You are responsible. Responsible. <laughs> Let me emphasize that. For your own discipleship. It was a disciple means a student. It means someone, the root word there is discipline. Christian formation takes time. Christian discipline takes time. You need to pray. You need to be in your word. You need to dig in your word. You need to meditate in your word. You need to uh, worship. You need to be around other sanctified people, people who are in the process of being sanctified. You need Christian community, right? Sometimes God calls us to solitude. Ooh. Sometimes God calls us to silence. <sighs> The introverts in the house said, thank you. These are all Christian disciplines, Christian formations that sets us apart and makes us more like him. And we need those back to become popular again in the church. Otherwise, we're going to keep being falling into one of the oldest tricks in the, in the book, right? One of the oldest false teachings, the Nicolaitans, and preferred grace. Well, another theory that I think actually could go along with it is that they believe that the Nicolaitans taught, um, they, they basically believed in <clears throat> the authority of church leadership to the degree that they lord it over the laity. And what I mean by laity is um, the people of the church, okay? And so any time that you see church leadership lord in their position, their authority, then they are not modeled by Jesus because Jesus was a servant. He served. And so all of us, we believe that all of us are called to serve Jesus, that I am no greater than you because I went to school and I'm credentialed or blah, 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 because y'all know I just went to school, okay? So <laughs> I am no greater than you. You are no greater than me. Pastor Josh is no better than me except for most days. I'm making up for what I said earlier. Um, <laughs> but it's, none of us are greater than one another, right? We are all loved by God, and when we try to lord it over people, what, there's a things that happen. One, then you become dependent like a child on a mother that, or a father that has to take care of all your spiritual needs instead of knowing how to go to Jesus yourself. Or two, you can be manipulated, especially if somebody likes that. Some people like that attention. The Bible says we're tested by the praise we receive. That's a question they just asked me in this self-evaluation. Like, okay, what, why do you want to do what you're, what, you're, what you're going to school to do? Because is it because you want to be like some great advisor, some great savior? Ooh, Lord, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. We have to know it comes back to because I'm called by God and I'm being obedient and I'm walking out my obedience to Christ with fear and trembling. All of us need to walk out our obedience with fear and trembling. So whichever boat you fall into, or maybe you think it could be both of these, we need to watch out for those teachings of the Nicolaitans. We don't want to be a church that perverts the grace of God. We don't want to be a church that lords over our authority over one another. Amen? All right, so we got to battle this false doctrine. We have to confront it in love and say, we don't have room for that. That's how we overcome compromise. And we overcome compromise by committing to repentance. These last two are pretty quick. Jesus called him and said, listen, this is what I hold against you, but you can repent. You can turn. Repentance means a change of heart, mind, and direction. You can repent. And when you repent, Jesus calls the church to repentance. He emphasizes the urgency. Friends, sometimes in the church, we have lost the urgency of, of repentance. It's not just I repented when I got. Some people have only repented to ask God to forgive them their sins when they first got saved. I don't know about you, but I know I've sinned at least once this week. <laughs> I got four kids, at least once, right? I better repent daily. I better ask, like, like David did, like, search my heart daily. Repent so that I can be right, so I can be ready for when he comes, and so I can cleave to him, so I can, I, I can bear fruit with keeping with my repentance. That's what John the Baptist said, bear fruit with the keeping of your repentance. Bear fruit, friends. If you truly re repent, then, then, then change is going to happen. It's not just saying I'm sorry. I mean, right? Like, I got kids. I'm like, come on, dude. That's not cool. Sorry. 
bro, like, sorry. I don't force my kids to uh, apologize like I used to when they were younger. Because I'm like, it's fake. Like, search your heart, bro. <laughs> yeah, and I'll bro them, too, because they try to bro me. I'm like, I did not gain, like, 200 pounds between the four of you guys. <laughs> Go through hours and hours of labor to be called bra. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, like, when we're in the, um, they, uh, they're about bra, I'm like, no, bra, like, you bra, like, come on, check yourself. <laughs> we got to repent, and we got we to gotta keep fruit with our repentance. So this is the thing I want to encourage you to do. The, la- the next time you feel conviction from God, and he, he's, he's on you, and you're like, man, you were short with your spouse. You were a little, you, you gave into an angry outburst to your children. You, you're the adult. You should be the one who's emotionally regulated, okay? Ugh. It's hard when you're a very passionate person to be emotionally regulated. <laughs> but I, I, told, I told a girl in, in one of the classes that I subbed today. No, I told a boy, actually. It was a boy. Someone came in, and they were like, Rrr! and then they were like, oh, oh, and they were, it's Toledo Public Schools. They were, they were ready to go. I'm going to knock this over. <laughs> and I said, and the, the person left, I said, listen, you can't let someone else's, uh, you know, attitude affect you for the rest of your day. You have got to learn to shake that off. You have got to learn to emotionally regulate. You feel someone else is, you know, coming in and they're just like super angry and they got a bad mood and all of a sudden you feel like on your, I was like calm and cool and collected and now all of a sudden I'm, I'm feeling like some kind of way. So for me, I feel it in like in my chest, like in my throat, like right here, like little, little, little you know, right there. It's like, mm, it's just what, okay, I need to walk away. A lot of times I need to go speak in tongues somewhere in the corner where no one can hear me. <laughs> I need to pray. Sometimes I'm like, God, get them. You see your girl down here doing her best. Get them, God. <laughs> and sometimes God does. And sometimes God's like, well, let's work on you real well, You know, let's work on you first. Calm down. You can't let someone else throw you off like that. And it's so easy because we live in a world with people. And as much as we love people, especially our people, there's some of our people that can, like, really get underneath our skin. And we've got to learn to repent and to bear fruit with repentance. Amen? The urgency, the urgency to continue to adhere to the truth of God's word and to keep fruit, okay? Last but not least here, wrapping it up. To overcome compromise, it's counting on my heavenly reward. Counting on my heavenly reward. We need to develop an eternal mindset. You're not, I mean, God has a lot of pleasure for us to have here. Okay, and I'm not like, man, you can't live a good life here. No, I want to live a good life. I am. So I, one of the kids asked me this week, like, oh, you live in the hood? You poor? I said, I am future rich. <laughs> I ain't claiming that poor stuff. But y'all keep eating every single food that I packed in my little lunch box. It's going to be a little rougher right now. But I am future rich. Like, we got we to, gotta, like, we got to stop that, right? There are blessings for us to have here, but I don't want all my blessings to be here. And in heaven, I have nothing to show for the work that I've done. Man, we need to give when no one's looking. We need to serve when no one knows. Send that note of encouragement to somebody when nobody, when nobody knows that, that you did that, right? Go out your way to encourage someone. Take them out to eat. Love on them. Share the gospel. Guess what? The church needs the gospel just like the world does. But the world needs it too. If you're looking for ministry opportunities, you don't even need a diploma anymore to substitute at Toledo Public Schools. And if you want to substitute, you go in there and tell them, Joy Hester, maybe they'll give me a bonus. Sent me. (laughs) Because they need help. I could work every day for them, but I don't have time every day. I'm only trying to do like one or one and a half, two days tops. But everywhere and everyone needs Jesus. There's more ministry in this world that we live than you can shake a stick at. That is so Southern, but I'm telling you, it's so true. It is so true that people need Jesus, and we need to have our reward in heaven and not just here. And guess what? He says that if you repent, if you keep 
fruit with repentance, then he's going to give you a heavenly reward. And these are three things that he mentions right here in the scripture. Hidden manna. Ooh, what's hidden manna? Well, Matthew 4, 4 says man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you've been in that place and you're like, I read my Bible and I don't really get it. Well, ask God for some hidden manna. You know what I believe that means? That means hidden revelation. It's not just from a first read. That might, in my theology classes, they call it the second read. You might not get that until it's the second read, until you go through it again and you read it again with eyes that are open to the Spirit, ears that are open to what the Spirit is saying. And he will give you that hidden manna, especially when you overcome. He says that he's going to, that there's going to be a white stone. That white stone symbolizes medals that were given to victors at games in the interest of the banquet. Guess what? In heaven, there's going to be a banquet feast. We're going to eat in heaven, y'all. Woohoo! And not get fat. Hallelujah. <laughs> we're going to, I'm telling you, friends, it's going to be a glorious sight. We can have all the carbs we want in heaven. It's going to be glorious. And, and these, these white stones were these metals that were given. The Bible says that, that he's going to clothe us with, with, with clo- clothes that, are, that he's going to give us. He's going to give us treasure. And guess what? Most of us are going to lay it right down at his feet. Right down at his feet. Because the real reward is Jesus himself. But there is a reward in heaven for those who are obedient to, to God and to Christ. And then my favorite out of all of it, he's going to give us a new name. I remember in like 2012 or 2013, I was in the hospital, super sick. My kids were really small back then, super sick. I, I mean, I literally could have died. I had sepsis. It was, it was, it was bad. Um, and I had one of the most powerful encounters with God I ever had in the hospital room, more powerful than any conference I've ever been to, any prayer retreat I've ever been to. God spoke to me. It it seemed like it was hours, and it was probably only only moments, but in that time, he gave me a new name. It was a nickname that he spoke to me that means something to me, that every once in a while when I'm in deep prayer with the Lord, I still hear him speak. And friends, I don't care what you have been called in your life. Maybe you've been called a loser. You're never going to amount to anything. Maybe you've been called, you know, you're controlling, you're mean, you're this by other people. But guess what? God doesn't call you those same names that man calls you. He says you're an overcomer. He says you, you are the apple of his eye. He says that you matter to him, that you are worth dying for. He loves you so much that he gave his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And he is writing our name in the Lamb's book of life, but we've got to endure to the end. we got to look at our life and say, is there any compromise in our life? We need, to have dil- we need to have diligence for doctrinal truth. We need to avoid carelessness of, of falsehood, of theological compromise in our life, and we, we have to have no room for a compromise in those little sins that eat away at the holy life that God has called you to. Would you stand to your feet, friends? Let's not only resist Satan, but let's resist every single smaller demon that he sends towards us. Every single smaller compromise in our life. We just close our eyes. Thank you, friends. I went just a couple minutes over.